Hi everyone. Um, we wanted to put this together because I know for a fact for me, when I was graduating from art school, I was pretty clueless about what a career path for someone like me would look like. And I really wished that there were people out there that would kind of show me the way um, and share some insights and wisdom. Um, and I'm really glad that we have a really amazing group, very diverse group of professionals from the art world here. Um, so I'll introduce everyone one by one and then we have some interesting questions prepped that hopefully will guide you towards um, ways to proceed. Um, Colin um, is a very experienced art handler. We um, started working together probably 10, 15 years ago it's on Mayberry Street. Close to 15, um, maybe. Yes, it's been, it's been a while. Um, Georgina is a specialist in auction houses. Um, and um, Sarah is from the fundraising world. And I'm Diana, and my path is sort of a winding path of an artist turned educator, um, turned speaker, and um, this new space has been great because it's been a really nice way to combine it all together. Um, but to get us started, I'd love for Colin to start us off and tell us just a little bit about your journey in the art world, how you ended up doing what you're doing, um, Okay. Yeah. Yep. I uh, graduated from museum school here in Boston. Um, you know, almost 25 years back. I mean, tw in 2000, in the year 2000. So after that, I spent a few years doing um, audio video stuff, which I did a lot of in school. I mean, that school back then was sort of a free for all and we did a lot of things. I mean, in school, I did a lot of AV work, worked in the video department, did a lot of printmaking, worked in the screen shop, um, and then was an editor for a few years after school. And I think I really realized, I love that kind of work. I love sitting there and, and being a filmmaker or an audio file and collecting sounds and but sitting there in front of the computer every day for hours on end, professionally, and then coming home and trying to do your own work, um, I realized I just needed to be moving around more. And I actually started working as an arborist like for like two or three years after that. So I was climbing trees and you know having fun with chainsaws for a few years. But it's tough in the winter and so I started kind of branching out during the winter, sort of doing art install stuff with galleries and still doing video stuff freelance, still doing some tree work here and there. It was kind of a mix until sort of all, most of it became art install, art handling, like fine art services, shipping, crating, um, some restoration stuff. Uh, just depends on who the client is and I've pretty much been doing that since 2005 about or 2007 maybe professionally mm -hmm. so that's where I am now and I'm pretty I work independently now fine art services um, that's where I'm at that's a pretty cool path. I had no idea that museums cool and then trees and then art handling, but it yep. all sort of is connected, I guess. Yeah. I think so because um, I was like a gymnast as a kid and yeah. used to climb trees a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think like heights and not having a problem with heights helped with tree work, obviously, mm -hmm. but also when I was in school, and even after school, up until like the 20 teens sometimes, sometime I was doing a lot of sort of uh, this performance art stuff that was wrestling as well. So we'd dress up in costumes and wrestle each other and, and make costumes and props, and so it's a lot of fabricating storylines 
lines, and it was very it was theatrical. But I was sort of like the high flyer guy, you know, because I was fine with heights, so I could, you know, jump around a lot. And then in terms of art stuff, it's like I would climb up ladders and have no problem with heights, especially with large works and things like this. So people, you know, would send me up the ladder, I guess. And, um, that I think acrobatics helps too, just like <laughs> being on top of the ladder and like holding a heavy sculpture or something and getting the cleat in the wall and you know, it's a, it's a dance. Really Sometimes it's dance. a little dance. <laughs> and balance. Yeah. So that's, those are my skills. That's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. Oh, that's amazing. Skills that translates into the opera. That's awesome. It is. It is. Um, Georgina, what about you? What's your path? So, good question. Uh, so I never was an artist, I guess I would say. I should make that clear. I approached the art world um, because I majored in art history in college. Uh, I took like an art history 101 class my freshman fall and had never been exposed to art history before, but just was like, oh my gosh, you could write papers about paintings? Like, this is so much more fun than English class. Like, I just loved the sort of learning about history like through a visual lens and then learning about a culture through that. I just academically fell in love with it. Um, so I majored in art history and experimented with different uh, career opportunities through internships throughout my college years. I was a tour guide, but I went to as a tour guide for the Harvard Art Museums. I interned at the Gardner Museum. I interned at Sotheby's in New York. And I really fell in love with the business side of the art world um, at Sotheby's. And so when I graduated, I knew I wanted to stay in Boston, but try and find um, sort of the, that intersection of art and business and ended up working at Grove & Company, which is a fine art auction house here in Boston. And I've been there for 10 years now. And so I started out, and this is advice I give to any young people starting out, I started out my first title was assistant to the directors. Um, you really cannot have an ego in this business. Um, and I you know, was given the opportunity to grow and take on more responsibility. And so I started running the fine art department in 2016, I think, two years after I started, um, and continued to grow our fine art department. Um, and then I actually ended up buying the company from the founder a year ago. So, oh, wow. Yeah, Congratulations. Thank you. But um, that is my path in the art world. Oh, that's amazing. That is. Um, what about you, Sarah? Um, well, I just always loved music from the time I was six. Uh, I played the piano, the organ, the clarinet, and the oboe. My mother actually made a sign that said piano closed on Sundays <laughs> because she was like, I need a break. Um, but I just was so passionate about it and then really just decided uh, you know, to really focus on the piano and went to undergrad and then Boston Conservatory for my graduate degree. And um, where my teacher kind of blew my mind because we were talking about, uh, he said, what is the most important thing in music? And I, I said, well, is it phrasing or the melody? He said, no, it's actually silence. How do you approach silence? How do you leave silence? And what is the sound juxtaposed against the silence? So we were, we were having these very philosophical discussions. So I got out of school and I had, you know, was teaching at New England Conservatory. I was uh, coaching opera accompanying ballet classes. And after two years, I just felt that I couldn't live inside this studio, kind of inside my head any longer, that I needed to get out into the world and not just be focused on, you know, how, how did so-and-so play that phrase in 1926, but just really, um, you know, experience the world and experience the arts. So I worked um, at the Huntington Theater, painted the stage, and I worked at the Boston Chamber Music Society for a year, and then I worked at the Boston Symphony for eight years, first in fundraising and development, because I knew the rehearsal protocol about how to write about the music. Um, there's a lot of transferable skills, and I, that would be my one point of advice, is um, you know you have this passion for the art, but actually the, your strongest trait, and the most important trait, is your creativity. You know, how can you engage the community to love that? Or how can you build an educational program that shows up for an artist? And so if you use that creativity, you'll always have different types of volunteer and employment opportunities um, that will just 
let me meet really interesting people and go around the world and just have wonderful experiences supporting what you love. That's beautiful. We saw how a gymnast's career translates into the art world um, and how art history brings you to something entirely different. Um, and it's funny because when I did my, um, so my path, um, I did my undergrad in painting and then um, got really scared of the stigma of the starving artist. So I fled the art world and uh, worked in international relations for a few years because I speak a few languages. Um, but then I really missed it, so I thought that going into the gallery world would really be perfect. Um, but it was, uh, it had its own challenges. And, um, and when I had my, when I was pregnant with my second child, um, I left the gallery world and opened an art school instead uh, because I really thought that this was lacking in Boston. It was either very artsy, craftsy and do whatever you want or you go into the MFA and you just copy the masters. But, um, and, and I just really wanted to find kind of that middle ground between um, quality art education um, and the snooty gallery world. Um, and I went in for grad school at BU, um, hoping, because they advertised it as arts administration, um, the arts administration degree that I got um, as business school for art people. But it was solely focused on fundraising mm -hmm. and the nonprofit sector. And I kept saying, but what about the auction houses? What about the galleries? What about the art fairs? And it was almost like taboo to be talking about it. And um, and it was very disheartening to kind of avoid all of that. Um, and, um, and that was another reason why I wanted to put something together so that people can sort of see what the different options are. Um, and that the art world is so much bigger than, um, than everybody tends to think. Um, now, right now, since we've kind of meandered through our paths, what would you say, and whoever wants to take this question on first, you're welcome to. Um, what do you think is your the most gratifying part of your job today? I can answer that first. Yeah. I think of the, the clients, the people. I think, you know, because what I do, and I can explain for a minute, sort of, the, the auction market is the secondary art market. So I'm not working with living artists. I'm pretty removed from the people who created the art. Um, most of the art paintings we sell are by artists who died 100 years ago. Um, so when I say the people, I don't mean the people who made the art, but just the people who collected it, who maybe did know the artist, who have built a beautiful collection in their homes and now it's time for them to downsize or their children have inherited it, they're at a point of transition. Um, and just hearing those stories and sort of, I really believe that objects kind of imbue, get imbued with um, all of the people who love them and all the, the history that they've seen and been through. Um, and so working with consigners, people who own these objects, and then talking with the potential buyers and, and getting to sort of share the stories of where this painting or this piece of jewelry, because that's the other big part of our business has been, and then talking to buyers about how this fills a perfect hole in their collection, or they've been looking for something by this artist for 50 years and have never seen something that's so perfect as this. And, and learning from both sellers and buyers. You know, every auction is different. Every, we were saying earlier, like every house you walk into to visit a client, you don't know what you're gonna find. And so just the, I think the human element of what I do is my favorite part. It's beautiful. Most gratifying? Um, I don't know. There's, I, I think it's similar with people, and like you're talking about objects and people's relationships with those objects. Like I sort of experience a lot of that as well when I go into people's homes. I, I do go into people's homes a lot. I work for private collectors, so you know they're they have this relationship with whatever it is, paintings or this that, and um, you know they can be very very generous people. They can be very complimentary as well and like flattering, like make you feel, make me feel like what I'm doing 
looks really good. They're very excited about it. Now they get to experience this print, you know, whatever in their home. Um, I think it's, you know, there's just something about that relationship that's satisfying. Uh, but I also love materials and I am just manipulating materials of all different kinds. And so, uh, so much stuff comes across my desk that I can use those skills. Uh, it's just fun for me to like cut wood or paint, you know, or figure out how to do something new, like these colonial platters that I hung last week, you know, using those, these adhesive discs. I don't know, those are kind of nice. I have never used them on something that large before. I've used them on small things, but you know, little experimentations problem solving, how am I gonna do this for the client? Because a lot of clients and collectors of art and people who buy it, um, they really don't know much about what goes into creating it. And having an artist background is certainly helpful, being familiar with the materials, being able to talk to them about the materials, being able to put them at ease about the materials, or being able to let them know that you have their best interest in mind just by just dropping some knowledge on them about the materials, <clears throat> whether they need to know it or not, you know, just like makes them feel more comfortable, like that you know what you're talking about or something, you know. Um, so it's, it's being able to just take all of those skills that I've, you know, gained, not only in art school, but since then, like working with this stuff. And, and even the artists don't always, plan for things when it's, when it's being installed. So a lot of the problem, I have to problem solve for a lot of the artists themselves as well, at least the living artists. It's, it just depends on where the piece is coming from, I guess, in that situation, if it's coming from the collection or from the artist's estate or whatever. Um, yeah. You never know, guys. Uh, I, I, um, I had a commission a few years ago and um, and at the same time, this one woman was moving to Greece and she said, I bought all these canvases and obviously I'm not gonna take them with me, so just take them, it'll be amazing if you put them to good use. And I thought, okay, great, I'm gonna get nice pre-stretched canvases, beautiful. So I painted this commission on one of these canvases, which was a cheaply stretched canvas <laughs> from Blick. And it was a beautiful piece, but the woman was moving to Cape Cod. Um, and between the moves, you know, Brookline to Cape Cod and, you know, back and forth, the stretcher got warped uh, mm -hmm. with the changes in temperature, humidity, and um, something that I wouldn't have thought of, you know? Um, you had to live it first. Exactly. Live it. Yeah, yeah, but all of these things that are coming up. Yeah. Um, so yes, appreciating materials. Right. And investing in those materials too. I mean, yeah. from an artist's standpoint, certainly. Once you, maybe it takes the, a dozen or two dozen paintings to paint and experience and have them around long enough that you actually see what happens to the canvas. You see what's happening to the stretcher bars before you realize, or maybe, not so new, but before one maybe realizes they need to invest a little more into supporting these stretcher, these, the canvas supports or, or more, expen more expensive, uh, have somebody craft this for me. Maybe there's somebody out there who, like I'm good at painting, Maybe there's somebody out there who's really good at stretching canvases. Mm -hmm. um, you know, little things like that. When, once, it, once your art reaches a certain level, you want to be, you, know, you want to, you want to present present a really nice piece somehow. You know, sometimes you want it to just look nice, even on the back, even <laughs> even from the back. So when someone buys it, when you look <laughs> at the back, you know, they don't see a bunch of scotch tape on there. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, what about you? Um, was uh, I guess what's gratifying for me is just really uh, removing barriers for people because when you look at the classical, the top classical composers, they weren't wealthy, they didn't uh, mingle with the kings and queens unless they were you know, their sponsors. So, um, and I've always felt that it's important for everyone to have access to music. So, um, uh, when I was at the Boston Symphony, I wrote this grant because there's a whole 
um, group of people that live in the Fenway that can't afford to go to the Huntington Theater, the Mafe, or the Boston Symphony. And so what we did is um, they got free tickets to attend the Boston Symphony, free lessons in whatever instrument they wanted at the New England Conservatory. And then the um, Huntington Theater, uh, there's two very tall uh, towers that house elders. They're um, fixed income housing. And so they created this like oral history story and had them tell, come up on the stage and tell their stories and then they wrote a play about it and then presented it to them. So it's just, you know, why should you live across the street for five years, 10 years and not be able to go in or not feel welcome? And then uh, more recently, I was working with a, a group in Kendall Square and they take high school kids who have GEDs and they train them for four months on digital photography and videography, which of course every business of any size needs. And then they place them in really good jobs with benefits. Um, and so this young black man uh, was uh, sent to video a black poet at the Gardner Museum. He was doing a reading. And um, he came back to the office and he said, he, and he grew up in Central Square. He said, I never felt like I could go in to the Gardner Museum. And he said, after videotaping the poet, I could see myself successful there professionally. And I, it just really opened my eyes because I thought I would have felt, even as a high school kid, I could just walk in and then day a week. So, you know, just kind of letting people see what's possible for them and also um, what's welcoming and uh, to enrich their lives. It's beautiful. I actually um, just shared her. My family list, I was in Mexico City for a few days last week and it was um, really difficult because of so many contrasts. On one hand you have these grandiose marble palaces with murals and museums that are just state of the art, uh, but on the other hand you have these really poor people who would not be able to go into those museums and I shared that with my mailing list and one of the gentlemen responded that they had a really interesting incident um, when they went to Haiti and they met with a number of students in Haiti and looked at their art and thought that it was really great. So they brought the students over to create projects for Artists for Humanity here in Boston and everything kind of had to be created in terms of the itinerary for these students on the fly, they're high school kids. And, um, but this gentleman thought that one of the kids had really, really great talent. So he walked him over to BU and showed the work to some of the faculty there. And the faculty just thought it was incredible. And they ended up giving him a scholarship and he's now a really famous mural artist out in Houston, Texas. Um, so it's just a really touching story on how if people are given a chance to see themselves somewhere they, where they maybe couldn't before, um, that their whole life itinerary can change. Um, so she thought that was beautiful. What about challenges along the way? Because I'm sure there were some. Anybody want to share some challenges in the career path? I think for me, the biggest challenge um, in the gallery world was on one hand, you do meet amazing people, but on the other hand, there are some really difficult folks, especially when I worked in Palm Beach. It was, um, it was challenging. Um, but also the, you know, the fact that you know, before the Me Too movement, before COVID, you were just really expected to be there 150% of the time and really put it off, you know, put in all of your energy and it was tough to step away. Um, and as a young mom, I kind of had to make a choice um, and just step back, um, which I think was the right thing to do. But, um, but it's, been, it's been really tough walking away from, uh, you know, a really nice, salary and then kind of starting from scratch um, and going in a different direction. I think yeah. one of the biggest challenges is, you know, it's part of the reason why I'm here tonight is just there is no set 
career path in the arts. Mm -hmm. And even I remember in undergrad, like the career services office didn't have any advice. You know, all my friends were going <laughs> still into don't, right? like <laughs> finance or consulting or pre-med or pre-law. Like, <laughs> there was this path they were on of like, well, you get this internship and then you do that and then you go to grad school and like, this is the path. And I mean, I think in life, we all kind of get off that train of like, what you're expected to do or what the path is at some point. But I think for the arts, it's often a lot earlier than for other professions or other career paths. Um, and even in my 10 years working since college, like there's been so many moments where it's like, as you like, should I go to grad school? What program would I do? Do I want to go to business school? Or do I want to get a master's in art history? And just, it, it's so like decentralized, I think. Um, and, and there, you know, I have had been fortunate to have wonderful mentors, but, Absent of that, I think it's really hard to navigate at any stage of your career. You know, what what are your options? How do you get to where you want to be? There's not a lot of resources out there. So. And both both of you hit on something that <clears throat> isn't necessarily my big challenge, but it, it, it's a challenge in a way. Is you know, I would love to live a little further outside of town. There's just less, much less business for someone in my field there. And what you two are both talking about sort of is like the infrastructure around the artist or the would-be artist, right? Whether you're in Haiti or if you're in Boston, much different playing fields, much different scenario to like, not only be exposed to art, but have people be exposed to yours. I mean, it could easily be, you know, a, some other city like <coughs> Boston versus New York or Cincinnati versus Indianapolis, it's gonna be a different group of people. And the, and the arts sort of depends upon, you know, it, it to be financially viable, right, for that city to support, it, <coughs> to support that community. Um, so if there's not support for that community in the first place, people aren't really gonna go there to do that stuff. Um, I, mean, I would love to just move out in the middle of nowhere, you know? <laughs> but it's it's hard to, <clears throat> when all my clients live in town or around town, you know, whether they're designers or galleries or, oh, thank you. Um, that was very thoughtful. <laughs> uh, you know, you're not gonna have the same clients if, you, if you're in Burlington, Vermont, right? I mean, so that can be challenging because it sort of limits you now. I, I, in, in my situation, I've been lucky because I've been able to dictate my own schedule to a degree. And up until I had a daughter a couple of years ago, I was able to take like lots of time off and travel and do things and then work and then take time off. And you know, um, so I think it's important when you're younger to remember that you, there are options like that to to live a little bit differently than you know the nine to five, the typical nine to five. Um, and also as an artist, there's just so much, it's not just fine art. I mean, there's so much more that can be done. Like I look at the people who work at like Disney or places like this and like create these spaces, you know, they're not like putting their work on a gallery wall. They're, they're having their work right there being interacted with by people, by the thousands every day. You know, there's really cool things out there for people to do. Um, but again, that infrastructure needs to be there to support you. And so I think like keeping your mind open to things, different ways of going about creating, you know, your career is important at that age. You know, I mean, thinking in terms of like college age, I guess. <laughs> I guess um, I would say one challenge is you need to be comfortable with financial instability. You can suddenly get this big project that pays really, really well and then not have any work for a month or two. So uh, just being flexible, I think. And not spending it all yeah. because you might need it you know, <laughs> a month from now. Um, yeah, I think that is kind of the story of every entrepreneur is that you can't, really count on anything. Like we had months back on, when I was on Newbury Street where Kanye West would come in and uh, purchase something and it's great. And, but then the next month it's back down to zero and you're, it, it just never stops. Um, so, it's, so it's really tough to kind of 
keep that and, and be able to budget and um, and have have some money to kind of set aside just you know just for the for the rainy day. Um, if you could imagine yourself as a twenty year old, what advice would you give yourself? Start with Sarah. Um, what advice? Well, I think I would tell myself to just be more courageous, to, to ask more questions. And um, when I was being treated unfairly or, or someone I was working with was being treated unfairly, to just kind of politely ask about that. And um, I think that, that was what I would say. I'd say don't be afraid to network. I think that that's something that is, People are so happy the females that are giving advice and giving our perspective. Like it's I find it very rewarding to talk to young people who are just starting out in their careers. And so I think I remember being 20 and I would be like terrified to send an email or cold email someone and just um, know that people like want the best for you and want you to succeed and are probably genuinely interested. And also if the worst that's gonna happen is someone's not gonna answer your email. Or you're going to get a 20 minute coffee and you're like, well, that was awkward, and then it's over. <laughs> but so much good can come from putting yourself out there. So, whether it's figuring out what you want to do for a career or promoting the art you're making, I think just even if it's not in your nature to be outgoing, I think of it as, as part of the job to, to self promote. Yeah, I think that's, that's what I would think too. I, I, would, I would want to just remind myself, yeah, it's okay to self-promote you know it wasn't I had I wasn't very comfortable uh, with that whole angle but that's all you're doing in the arts if, especially if you're if you are an artist um, it, it, you are a commodity you know you have a product you need to sell that product um, yeah maybe like don't be afraid to self-promote you know follow through with people like and I'm only figuring some of this out now that like thank you notes are really nice, like little things like this. I always sort of, you know, maybe I'm sexist, but I always thought it was something like my mother and like the aunts and, and like my sister did and like the women in my life did. They sent thank you notes and things like this. But um, I think that's smart. When someone, you know, puts in effort to make, to do something for you. And just more than just that, it's just keeping in touch with people and like following through, like, you know, maybe making sure you say hi to somebody if you see them in passing or, you know, things like this. I think it's, it, it's yeah, networking, but even like not even in like such a secular sense, it's mm -hmm. like, in, like a spiritual way too, just sort of like making those connections, you know. I think that's really important. I think going along with the networking theme for the longest time, and. Just like you said, I'm thinking I'm finally figuring this out now. Um, I would think of people as potential clients and trying to think of angles on how you know how do I do this, how do I get them to buy this, and um, and coming to realize that the more you just give from the heart and share, and I think that's one of the reasons why I like these speaker events, because um, we've all had our journeys and we all have something to contribute to the world and to say and to, um, to share, and it's valuable to someone, and kind of the more you give, the more you get. Um, and with networking, it's, it, it's really not about, you know, who, who is gonna be my next go to um but really just those genuine connections are, are super important and you never know like you bump into somebody 10 years later yeah you know somebody disappears for five years and you never even really think about that person but then suddenly you're in a situation where you have to work with this person again or you're working with somebody that's really close to that person you know you, you don't know you don't know yeah, it's especially in a small I, town like Boston. Yeah, I still work with the same framer that I've worked with for 20 some years. Um, and I would disappear for a few years and then come back and 
Colin and I haven't seen each other since my gallery days, which was 10 years ago. Um, and then he was the first person I thought of when I needed to get the space set up and get the storage set up, and I knew that someone that I could count on. Um, so yeah, you yeah, never know. Um, now on to what you see right now in the art world. Is there anything um, that you think of as a current issue? Um, and what do you wish you could change? Good question. Good that. Yeah, it's a big one. <clears throat> I see a lot of similarities to just the past. I feel like nothing changes except like the tools and the technology changes, but like we keep doing the same thing. Like I, there is like a socioeconomic bent to it, especially the, the fine arts um, that has always been there. Um, and you know we see it with, we see it in town. You know you see it. Who's going to be buying this art? Mm -hmm. You know. Um, you know buyers and collectors aren't always artists. Um, people are buying for, like, I, don't, I mean, this isn't a problem, but this is like, I just didn't, I see this as like a, as like a point of stress in the, in the arts. You know? People can be nasty in retail galleries, right? Yeah. It's like, you know, who's coming in? Are they going to buy? Are they, is this a buyer? I have to qualify this person. I go over to them like, oh, so how much, like, basically like, what do you have for art already? <laughs> you know, like, like, okay, this person's not ready to buy, they're not, I'm gonna go back and sit down and ignore them. <clears throat> Which is fine, it's capitalism, but like, it creates this atmosphere that some people, you know, are not, it's easy for me as somebody who goes in, does my job, leaves, but I think there's a lot of competition between, in sales, generally speaking, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're selling cars, that's pretty easy. Like all these cars are the same, and they all do the same thing. But here's the car. Here's what you're going to pay for it. With art, it's like an illusion. And who decides how much you're going to charge for it? Does the artist? Does the gallery? Does demand? You know, it's this whole like dance that has to be done, and it's just like art, it's just illusion, right? This isn't really. This isn't going to drive you home tonight, right? It's not going to, or it doesn't like plumb your sink. You know, there's some things are utilitarian and with art, you know, it walks this line, right? Even music sometimes is like easier for people to bring into their lives and, and, and understand because they just hear it and it connects. And, you know, with art, like, you're never sure what people are going to be thinking. Oh, my, my nephew could do that, or my, you know, my, my grandkids could do that. Why is that $10,000? You know? So everybody like feels free to have an opinion. And then, but some people want their opinion to be right. But what's right with art and wrong with art? I mean, I think there's a right way of painting something, but I don't necessarily <laughs> think there's a right way of painting it, right? I mean, so it's always that, that that's always this point of conflict. It's like, what is art doing? What are we all doing with it? Mm -hmm. You know, and why are we spending money on it? Or why are we, you know, it's, it's just the, it's the same old question, probably. It's a thousand years old, but. A couple it, of thousand. <laughs> we're always kind of <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, to the origins. Yeah. Um, I was, yeah, I was just wondering that same thing. Um, going to the socioeconomic, um, issues, um, there are people who never step foot into a museum um, because they just don't know what to look out for and they haven't had the right education to understand. And there's some museums that I don't understand as, as a professional artist and some of the uber contemporary installation pieces and the art fairs. Um, and yeah, and there's so many different layers and it's such a secret world to a lot of people. Even a lot of people who have money are afraid because they don't feel like they're educated enough to 
walk in um, or that they're good enough to walk in. They set up expectations. It creates all these expectations. Yeah. And so for some people, it's really easy. Collectors, I mean, because some people are collecting for investment purposes, right? And they want to, to know or to be pretty confident that this is going to gain value. And in those situations, their, their approach is different. Sometimes like, people just love it, right? And they just they want to look at it. And it doesn't matter if it's going to get more value or not, or how much they're going to pay for it or not. They just want it. So, I don't know, though. My response to that, seeing it on the other end, when then that collector has passed away or has to downsize and sell their items, it's like, my art is not a good investment. Because as you said, art, you know, jewelry, silver, other things that are collectible and saleable have intrinsic value. Like art is truly in the eye of the beholder. And people ask me that all the time. You know, what should, like, what should I buy that's going to go up in value? And when I look historically at the secondary market, artists do this and it's trend based and it's you know there's so many external factors that I just say to clients like, buy what's going to make you happy buy what you want to live with and look at because when it's time to sell it in 30 years you it, you know you might get lucky and it might be worth 10 or 100 times what you paid but it's just as likely that it's going to be worth the same as what you paid 30 years ago or less and so you have to think about well what else did I get from it it's not it's just not just the monetary return um, and, and I think that's what makes people passionate collectors and what's so special about art is the flip side of that, right? Because it's like, yeah, there's no value, but there's so much value. Mm -hmm. And it's different to each of us. Um, and so I think, and circling back to the socioeconomic side of it, I think that that's, you know, it, it's, having things on your walls makes you happy. I really believe that. And I think that trying to, agnostic of how much that item costs and so that's something that we think a lot about is just like especially for our generation where you know people, oh where millennials care about um experiences not things like that's something you read a lot in articles that there's sort of less value placed on objects which i think is true i see so many of my friends are going to their houses and like literally have nothing on their walls <laughs> and and so that's you know how is that because we're all staring at screens so much? I think that that's something that kind of scares me is the wrong word, that just makes me wonder of what the next generation, the next generation, are people moving further and further away from being surrounded by things, or is that a misconception and we're going to sort of swing back to value being placed on digital things that make you happy? That's the case. Well, the nice thing about like something like this is like, you don't have to charge it. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to like burn fossil fuels to like, keep it going. The number of houses I've grown to where people have it. the frame TV that's just like a slideshow of famous paintings, and I'm like, but you could have a real painting <laughs> for like less than this TV cost. <laughs> but yes, I think that's, there's a sustainability aspect too, right. in a way. So much of so what people want to be exposed to now, what they, or what they're drawn towards, it has to be. Powered. Yes. It's so like, true. Like, even just cracking up a, a book, it's like this has already been made. So the power has already been used. I can just read it, but well, I can get my phone out and just read. Like, you're paying for that right now. Like, I don't know. Yeah, that could so be an many, issue. So many homes that I've gone into that are these stunning spaces, right? Um, with huge white walls, and I, I just don't get it. How do, you, how do you live with white walls? Um, what about you, Sarah? Um, well, I was saying music, uh, the challenge is to uh, share more broadly the American experience or the European experience. So, but I think um, the major orchestras are really doing that by having music of more modern music, music of um, women and black and brown composers. Um, so I think I think that's pretty much covered. I would say. I loved we did um, we did an Australian unit with kids um, a few years back, and um, I had family in Australia, so I traveled out there at some point, and I just really fell in love with Didier Deuce and realized.
realize that now they have them in orchestras, um, which is such a cool thing uh, to introduce all of these instruments from indigenous cultures that um, we probably didn't know about. Um, but yeah, that's maybe that's something to borrow from the music world uh, and bring it into the visual world. Is um, and there are a lot of um, artists that are called naive artists, right? Or they, they don't come from a specific school, and there's um, there are a lot of people collecting that type of art, um, but just having more of a democratic way of having people access it. I think that's always been my biggest um, pet peeve. Yeah. Um, any other parting words, words of advice? Um, I didn't want to overburden anyone with questions, so I wanted to kind of keep it nice and light. Can you stay here longer? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so this is a little bit like off topic, not what is intended for the um, event, but I'm kind of, it's just like a personal curiosity question. Um, if you're an artist or if you like identify yourself as an artist, um, could you just like explain a little bit about your personal practice? Like what meaning you do, like what kind of drives you as an artist, and then also how that in turn correlates to your professional practice. Is anyone a professional artist still? <laughs> in any degree, even if you like to do little magazine collages. <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess I'm not regularly practicing art creation like I once did. I feel like uh, working in the industry, I feel like I'm doing it all the time, but it's just on the back side of everything. It's between like the sculpture and the wall, right? It's, it's just, it, it's, it's really silly stuff, but it's like, oh, higher and lower, or left and right, or, you know. To me, it's like, the, I'm not using it like, oh, I'm gonna make a pretty picture anymore. Now I'm, I'm like, we're gonna leave room on the on this mantle because you're gonna to want to put a lot of like you know your Christmas cards on it or whatever. Like, how do you use the space? Like, okay, well instead of centering it between the wall and the curtain now, because you need to shove your chest of drawers over because it's like a traffic area when you walk into this room, we're gonna off center this over here and that's gonna look right. Like, so it's suddenly. It's, you know, it, and this is like where art becomes like, uh, what are you talking about? <laughs> Left, right, up, there, what difference does it make? You know, six and one and a half. Yeah, but you know when you get it right. And but you know when you get it right. Yeah. Yes. And, and I think that's that's really a lot of where that energy for me is, is t turned these days, professionally, in terms of visual art. Um, I mean, I still, I still play music and um, I'm like an outdoorsy person. And I think a lot of like what used to go into this art stuff, you know, you just find different ways, at least I have, of, of channeling that energy. So like, I like to do research before a hike maybe. Uh, like, I, I like to try to find like old lost logging camps and things like this. Like I like to, the process to me, like of going through old newspaper clippings, looking at maps, this and that. I can almost trace it right back to when I was younger making art. There's a, this process, this collection, collecting images, ideas, like putting things together, and then finally moving forward with it or doing what needs to be done with it. Going to art school sort of actually made me a better student in many ways, because uh, I did get my BFA through Tufts through a program at the museum school at the time. And the way that by the time I got out of art school, I realized how to take those processes and kind of project it onto other parts of my life, and either other ways of learning things, like reading and like absorbing information differently. Um, that just wasn't really the same in, in just academics. Uh, here's the book, read it, now do this. Um, I was always someone who really needed to get my hands on it to really figure out why, you know. Sir, you said that you put a halt on performing during COVID. Yes. And I loved how you said that it's 
finding, and I never thought of it that way, <laughs> that finding a partner, it's almost like finding a romantic partner. Can you oh, definitely. Well, um, the group I played with before, um, it was two violins, violas, and a cellist, and we played together for about eight years, so, you know, I have, our dining room is my grand piano, so we would sit in my dining room, and, uh, and you know, it would be a 45 minute difficult Brown's work, and the violinist would be, you know, have his violin and be like, and that just sets the tempo, the mood, everything for the next 45 minutes. And everyone's just so tuned in. And what's very cool is no one's tapping their foot. Because what's happening is you're creating this music in the middle of where all of you are sitting. No one's in charge. You're creating this together. And so you have this agreement at certain points, this person will take the lead, or this melody, or this person plays at a little slower, so then when you come in, you play yours a little slower. So it's just this very uh, dynamic uh, conversation. conversation, yeah. And it's fun, I've played with um, people in their 80s, I've played with a 13-year-old girl who was very talented, a violinist, and it's kind of fun because the, the only thing you may have in common is music, you may not know um, anything about where they live or what are they married to, do they go to church, but you just have this one thing in common and that's enough. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. It's fun. I think that was actually the hardest thing for me when I went back into the art world from the backside working in galleries because I really thought that as an artist, I'd be able to do this part-time, but then really focus on my art. And what happened was that, partially because of the way the gallerists perceive the artists, um, unfortunately, I let go of my practice completely for about 10 years. Um, and it was only when I decided to kind of let the gallery world go that I, found the courage to get back into it because I realized how much of a piece of myself was missing. Um, so now, like every morning when it's quiet, I'm here painting and then uh, and sometimes people come in and they ask questions and it creates a conversation and everywhere I travel I paint as well and there's I feel like one of those, you know, jugglers in the middle of the street because then there's a crowd gathering and they're all offering their advice and <laughs> commenting and sometimes in Chinese and Japanese. And I'm like, yeah. um, but, um, but I think that's a really interesting and challenging part is finding that balance where you can do something that will give you um, a consistent income um, but then you're still really cognizant of the fact that you're a creative person and there's something in you that needs to be expressed and channeled and, and it's as important um, and, and finding the time to do both. Yeah. Well, you're looking at someone whose worst grade in high school was the one art class I was required to take. So <laughs> I would say I was funny blend and I'm a very visual person um, and, I, and I just love looking and thinking and learning, um, but I never have practiced art myself. I will say though that um, one of the hats I wear, because at this one company you wear many, many hats, is I do a lot of our graphic design. And that I think sort of what you were saying about making sure it makes sure things like perfect and it just looks that to me, I'm a pretty like type A person, so that for me is a very creative outlet of just getting that ad or a catalog or whatever to just you know when it's right. Um, mm -hmm. So that's as close as I come to an art practice. It's beautiful. I thank you guys. Really appreciate it. Um, all of these points. Yeah. Great. yeah. Um, I think yeah, right on time. Thank yeah. you for having us. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, and I, I love all of the different tidbits that everybody shares um, and kind of different ways of looking at the art world from various perspectives, but also seeing commonalities and common, like, humane or the common humanity in, in what we do and that human factor, yeah, like you said. Thanks.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.